President Nelson is saying, seek to be taught by the Lord himself. Be in the temple every chance you can. In essence, go into the Lord's university and, and gain these eyes to see and, and be taught by the Spirit. That's the only way we're going to we're going to get to that veil and pass through it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Spiritual Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Our team's mission is to help you have eyes to see the times we are living in, take unprecedented measures, to you prepare yourself spiritually for the events that will precede the second coming. Jesus Christ. If the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Survival. Um, Spiritual Survival, if you're just tuning in, is a podcast that I would say is... uh, designed for those who want to be amongst the five wise virgins, those who are seeking a, seeking a deep, intimate relationship with their Savior, seeking to prepare for the events that are going to precede the second coming. And uh, yeah, so tonight we have as a, a special guest, Nicole Hansen. Many of you may know Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I've seen uh, a number of Nicole's. Nicole has a, a channel of her own called Patterns and Sequences, and it's about understanding the, the uh, how would you say, the, the patterns in the in the temple endowment? Uh, yeah. The, uh, it, the, is that how you describe it? I say um, learning how to pattern our lives after the holy order and pattern of God and using the doctrine of Christ as that foundation. So essentially learning to become a temple. Yeah. Perfect. One of the reasons I wanted to have Nicole on uh, is because of the things that our, our prophet is talking about and, our, and you know, the, the apostles, the, the leaders of the church are talking about so much about uh, covenants and, and the temple right now. Uh, also, they've spoken a lot about the doctrine of Christ. And uh, in this last year, I've come to really feel like you could, you could lay out the, the temple endowment and just put the doctrine of Christ right over the top of it, that they, they just kind of, they're, they're the same thing, essentially, maybe with uh, you know, the endowment is the, is the, the doctrine of Christ uh, in, in symbolism, perhaps. And I'm a, I'm a lover of symbolism. And I, that's one thing I've loved about your channel is uh, you seem to be uh, really a student of, of especially temple symbolism. And, and so, uh, yeah, let's dive in. Uh, what would you start us out on if we were to discuss this topic of um, the, the doctrine of Christ and the endowment? Well, um, uh, the doctrine of Christ and the endowment. Well, when you go to the endowment and you're, you're watching, you're actually watching the entirety of the plan of salvation. And so um, what one way I describe that is the plan of salvation is we go out of God's presence and we come back in. But the doctrine of Christ is more specifically the way back. So when you go, when you go to the endowment, you're seeing beginning to end, you're seeing the creation, creation, fall atonement. But if, if we can learn here how to pick up on the doctrine of Christ, that's kind of post fall They're They're now trying to come back and then, we lay that doctrine to Christ that you can see where that kind of begins in the temple endowment where Adam and Eve begin to make their way back. And then that's where the doctrine of Christ comes in. There's certain things they have to know and learn how to, how to get back. And um, so we can talk about about that a little more. I have a diagram that kind of explains that, but I used to think the doctrine of Christ was, or just the doctrine was just scripture in general. But as I started going throughout the scriptures, I started to notice these patterns. That's why my channel is called Patterns and Sequences. Over and over again, these same things that the all the prophets were accomplishing were very symbolically similar. And you can even see 
um, Nephi often compares himself to Moses and you can really map their stories on top of each other um, as well. And so I realized that the doctrine of Christ was more specifically that, that pattern that they were fulfilling in their lives. Um, all fulfilling the same points along that way, but differently how they did that, you know, cause we're all different. And so, um, maybe we'll get into, I I've heard talked about a lot, especially elder Irene, the true points of the doctrine. And so I think it's really important to know one, why that's so important to know those things and into two, what those are. Yeah. I, I like to call the endowment, the, the fullness of the atonement because it, it kind of lays out what the atonement does from from beginning to end of the plan of salvation, and uh, also uh, the way to a, a deeper, intimate relationship with the Savior, as He brings us back to the Father. Mm -hmm. And kind of as you go along these points of the doctrine, or you progress in that covenant path, or down the endowment aisle is what I would call it, like a wedding a wedding endowment, um, you are taking upon you more of that character and gaining that greater relationship and stronger communion with Christ and, and God and all of, of creation. Yeah. There's a quote I heard uh, a few months back. It was from uh, James E. Faust. He said, the greatest need in all the world is for every person to have a personal ongoing daily continuing relationship with the savior mm -hmm. yeah. i think um elder redland's talk uh we can talk about that more but i think his really to me is is kind of how you do that what he just talked about yeah didn't he call it like a a continuing a cycle cycle yeah a cycle of uh, going yeah. through those steps of the of the doctrine of christ yeah. yeah so i think we should address that a little bit more too yeah. okay yeah, let's let's go there. Um, but uh, yeah, lead us out on that. Okay. Um, first thing, I'm going to share my screen here if I can. Oh, there we go. Um, and I am going to pull up this document here. This is what I go over a lot on my channel. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what? <clears throat> What this is, is this is Moses' tabernacle that he set up in the wilderness. And in Exodus, the Lord tells us that I'm giving you this for a pattern. And if you've ever been to, have you have you personally been to the uh, moving tabernacles that they do? Yes, yes. So when you go, right before you go in, do you remember what they have out there set up? Kind of the first station that you go to. Well, you, you come in the, the gate and then you, you come to the altar of sacrifice. Right before the gate, though, you have the, um, they have the serpent on the staff set up. Oh, yes, yes. And it's, it's implying that um, all they had to do was look. And so there's a lot of confusion going on in the world. There's a lot of confusion around doctrine, what's true, what isn't. And I look at this and I'm like, well, all you have to do is look. <laughs> All you have to do is look at this. This is it. This is what he set up. This is the pattern. And, and if you can take information and plug it in to this, um, it just, it brings all truth to light. So we'll go over it a little bit so you can see how that would work. Um, but when you read your scriptures and you start looking at their journey and realizing that everybody fulfills this pathway, it's a path that that the Lord fulfilled and opened for us so that we could fulfill. This is a covenant path and every prophet is doing the same thing. They're fulfilling their covenant path. And, um, the temple itself is set up just, just like this. Then suddenly the, all the complexity becomes very plain, very plain and precious, very plain and simple. So, um, what we have here is this is the gate and you guys, anybody who is not familiar with this can just Google Moses tabernacle in the wilderness and you'll see like a better 3d image. Uh, this is just a two dimensional, but this is the gate they entered. Um, you can, you would walk in here. This was the altar of sacrifice. This right here was called the labor of water. 
this is the tent. And there was another curtain here they would walk through. And then within it was another curtain and then the Holy of Holies right here. Can you see my cursor? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, I wonder if I can zoom in here a little bit. Um, there used to be a button, looks like it's changed. Okay, well, we'll just look at the basic. Oh, over, over on your left-hand side, there's a, a little plus sign button there. Maybe that's it, right there. Maybe not. <laughs> No. That's okay. Okay. Oh, all tools. Okay. No, not there either. We'll just make this quick. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Zoom back out a little bit. Okay. Well, actually, I need to zoom out here. So, <clears throat> what? So, when you look, go to the temple endowment, you're learning this entire thing. You're learning about creation. So, you are. Yeah, I've got written here, one eternal realm. Um, you're learning about creation, the fall, the atonement, and you have justification, sanctification, and exaltation. And um, it's kind of set up like a Hebrew chiasm. So you have A, B, C, B, A. Um, and so it's just kind of a mirror reflection. And the doctrine of Christ then is specifically the point where you are turning around and coming back. So uh, Nicole, um, explain the, the chiasm again. Um, where does it start? Does it start with creation? Okay. It starts with creation. Okay. So right here, creation, see, I have an A right here, A, mm -hmm. B, C, and then you come back, B, A. So okay. the easy way to think about that is in creation, we were with the father, right? You, it's kind of how it start. Okay. the story starts. Um, who's so in the center of a chiasm is always the the main focal point, and so the focal point here is the atonement. Is that am I understanding yes. that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so it's kind of these two mirror image, and then this is this is C. There's no C prime, right? It's A B C. Yeah. yeah. So because this is a he did it and it's done, and now we're going back. So uh, creation then is where we started in the celestial realm. And then Adam and Eve went into the terrestrial in the garden of Eden, and then they fell into the celestial. Okay, so when we come back into the millennium or the spirit world, that would be the millennium would be, a, again, a terrestrial world on our way into immortality and exaltation into, again, a celestial. Okay, so I think I have written here, um, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial there so you can kind of see that i have this available um for anybody that wants to print it off i know a lot of people take notes on it and completely changes their temple um journey and their scripture study it suddenly brings a lot of things into clarity yeah i, I read a book on the tabernacle oh 10 years ago that just really opened my eyes and helped me see this a lot more clearly so yeah the lord himself says this is the pattern and, and who else is the pattern? Christ is the pattern. This is the pattern he fulfilled. So um, I also like to think of this as, as thinking celestial. Uh, when President Nelson gave that talk, he said, he said something about people say he has too much temple in him. <laughs> well, I think this is how you do that. <laughs> like We should all have too much temple in us. It's learning to think and have a perspective through a temple lens. And so one, one example I give of that is when I, if, let's look at Noah's Ark as the story. This is kind of where it started to dawn on me. There's, there's like a celestial way you could look at that, which is, um, you know, do I, do I actually believe the story ever happened? Is this real or is this just some story? Okay. I believe this happened. That's kind of like stage one. I have faith that this happened. Then stage two is like, well, if this happened, then this is then a uh, symbol for what is to come again. So then it kind of becomes a sign of preparation, right? And so it's kind of that terrestrial state, like preparing um, because you have a hope in, in what it symbolizes, what it means, and that you, you it's kind of a prophecy, you know, it's going to happen again. Okay. And then there's a third way to maybe look at that with more of a celestial lens where it's like a temple and you have um, the ark. The only time God ever gives measurements in the scriptures is when he's measuring a temple. 
And the ark is one of those that he measured. He had Moses measure. And so you have that. And then you have three levels to the ark. And the male and female came inside and were sealed inside and rose above the chaos. So a lot of temple symbolism in that. And so when you start to look at the scriptures through this temple lens, um, I, it's like the mysteries of godliness unfold. And so this is one way I consider um, thinking celestial is, is to look at everything through a ten temple lens. Um, so this helps do that. I, I found that uh, to be so true. Nicole, um, once you start to see patterns and understand patterns, then you start seeing them everywhere and then you can't unsee them. Yeah. And we, I could do a whole thing about why would that be the case? I think, I think that connects us to godliness and I won't go into too much detail there, but, um, it's, it's the manifestations of God and it's kind of like, um, well, my neighbor, their kid bought a, um, a teal car. And I don't know that I had ever really seen a teal car or hadn't noticed until he had one outside. And then all of a sudden I started noticing them everywhere. And so, well, then I wonder, well, is it because I just noticed one? So now I'm noticing them everywhere. Or is it because I saw one that they're now being created everywhere. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's kind of like, was the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken? And I think the answer is both because we are godly beings coming here to have um, an earthly experience and learn to be like our God, who is a creator. I think that we're, we're learning to, this is a pattern of creation. And so as we come back into the, the presence of God, we learn more and more to be like him and take on more of that creationary aspect within the world in which we live. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it gives you um, eyes to see. Yeah, yeah. And just in this last year, there's things I'm seeing now in the Book of Mormon that I did not see at all before. Yep. And part of it's been, you know, I've, I've done a, a bit of a deep dive into Isaiah. Um, I've, I've really kind of done a deep dive into trying to understand the endowment. And I think it's this way by design, you know, for us to. to the glory of God is intelligence. And I think he's trying to grow our intelligence. And so there's an awareness that begins to grow and a level of higher consciousness that, that connects to, to his mind and will. And so, um, yeah, it's completely correlated. Yeah, and then we begin to see um, the the intimacy and the personal relationship that Christ offers us beneath these symbols. Yeah. And that's when it becomes really, really personal. And that's when this whole thing just becomes alive and life-changing. Yeah. And that's, that's the way I describe it. You become alive. It's you become a living record that's that's what's happening here and um the symbolism why symbolism well if you think about like the mcdonald's symbol for example if i see that golden arch i have all of these senses come to life i have the cravings of you know the chicken nuggets from when i was a kid i have the memory from when we were at Disneyland and my parents stopped on the way to McDonald's. We always want to stop at McDonald's. I have the memory that the memory of the smells come to mind, right? So many senses that tap into through a symbol. And yeah, it was the Michael Jordan commercial. Yeah, yeah, but right? Yeah. The universe is built off symbolism. God has designed these symbolisms. And, um, that is, that is really his language and he can use one symbol that can speak a million different messages to a million different people, right? Somebody else may not have the same experience I would have with the golden arch, but somebody else, but they might have their own. Right. And so <clears throat> I think that's how it becomes very intimate is you, you start to remember who you really are and you start to see your relationship with him um through it all through creation fall and atonement 
and um, in this symbolism. And it's kind of like you are unveiled in the process of this. So I love symbolism for that reason. Like you said, it's it's deeply intimate. I had kind of an insight um, just this week in, in an endowment session where I was thinking about symbolism and I, I felt like the, the Lord was teaching me that one of the reasons for symbolism is in this celestial world that we live in, there, there are not adequate words to describe the depths of the mysteries of God. And so yeah. putting them into symbols uh, allows us to learn them in layers. Yeah. And it, it unlocks it unlocks in the heart. It's more a language of the heart, I think. Yeah. And it, one thing to keep in mind, the, the symbolism, it seems to me there's a, there's opposition in all things. Right. And so you can see a lot of our same symbolism. In fact, a lot of people leave the church for this. They see our symbolism, they see it associated with something dark or evil, but Satan's not a creator, right? He only has, all he can do is lie and deceive. And so he can only take those symbols and try to twist their meanings in our minds. And so one thing I, I think of is, you know, in this world today, um, I just go and I Google the word love and all this um, pride comes up, pride, 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 pride. So people are growing up in this generation of hearing the word love and correlating it with pride. And so the synapses in the brain are disconnected. And the truth is this has been going on since the fall and we're just like kind of coming to the end of it. Love and pride is, is that final battle, right? But this has been going on the whole time. And so what the doctrine of Christ does is it rewrites through experience. It rewrites us. It, it rewrites our programming and, and then we get true context and can apply and can discern truth and error. Yeah, I like that. Um, so one thing, if we if we keep looking at this pattern here, I'm going to walk you through real quick how this correlates to our temple and our ordinances. And in this, this will just give you the most basic understanding of the true points of the doctrine. Um, and the reason the true points of the doctrine are really powerful and important and why you want to know that you don't just want to learn them you want to experience them is um i think president nelson's talk just really hit on this and elder Iring from last conference um he he talked about the true points of the doctrine and the brothers lehi and nephi well if you look at the power that lehi and nephi had they had the sealing power the fullness of the sealing power which meant they could command the elements by the voice of the Lord. They they had his voice speaking through them. And so understanding the true points of the doctrine is, is extremely important and more important that you have it written in the fleshy tables of your heart and the marrow of your bones. That's what President Nelson said. Um, it is that important, the fleshy tables of your heart and the marrow of your bones. So just think about how important that element of our bodies is and it might help teach you why it's so important that you literally have this written inside you. Um, it seems like it's directly correlated to the sealing power. So the fullness of that, that sealing power, the way Nephi and Lehi had had, had it. Um, <clears throat> so looking through the ordinances, oh, and then, and then I was gonna say, President Nelson talking about the sealing power in his last talk and then having ratified by the Holy Spirit of promise. So we can talk about that in a minute, but um, what we're looking at here is like the gate. What do you think of when you think of the gate? Well, um, typically I think of Jesus Christ stands at the gate. Uh, there's, there's no way through the gate except by him. Okay. The gate was also known as baptism. Okay. Yeah. So if we walk through this, just thinking of the ordinances, um, baptism right here at the gate, here would be the altar of sacrifice. And what ordinance do you think of when you think of that? Well, in the, in the endowment, uh, you know, I think of the, the law of sacrifice and 
we have to offer a, a broken heart and a contrite spirit to, you know, to repent. And we also do that again when we partake of the sacrament. There you go. That's the ordinance right there. Yeah. yeah. And so um, that would be, that would be like our sacrament today. And then we'll get into the laws in a little bit because you can kind of plug them in here as well. Um, the laws and the endowment right here is the labor of water. Yeah. Baptism. That would, that would be our initiatory. Oh, okay. So you're washed here, but then you're yet washed again. So that brings up a lot of question. Um, that's the thing about this is you'll see things and it'll spark questions. Cause I wondered forever. I thought, okay, so the Holy ghost is given here at baptism. But then when I read the doctrine of Christ from Nephi, I it's he's talking about the Holy Ghost right here. And I found my answer in DNC 88, I think it was, where it talks about anybody who enters in at a portion of the kingdom will continue until they receive a fullness of that kingdom. So this whole stage is technically the baptism of water or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This would be the, the fullness of that. So we'll come back to that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, so that's the labor of water. And if you pay attention, I can read from Exodus 40. It's a part of the initiatory ordinance, but it's in Exodus 40. And it says, thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him. Okay, when you have this, here, it suddenly makes a lot more sense what's going on um, in that initiatory ordinance. So this was known as the gate. This was known right here. This curtain was known as the door. So when they say unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, it becomes very easy to see what is happening at what point of the doctrine. This is the door of the tabernacle. They're being prepared to go in and enter it. They're being prepared to go in and be sanctified. That is the stage of sanctification. It's broken up into threes. And then there was, it was the gate, the door, and the veil. So I think that one will become pretty obvious. Would, the, would the door be synonymous with um, being spiritually reborn yes. and being justified, entering a terrestrial state yes. of being? See, look this at the... The Holy Ghost begins the sanctification process and... You, you, you stay in that process of sanctification as you walk the covenant path. Exactly. So if, if you just plug exactly what you said right into this justification, you have been justified and you're now being prepared to be sanctified. So, and the, so that is a rebirth. There were two veils described in the scriptures, one here and one here. If you read uh, Joseph Smith's um, about the two comforters, in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, it's on page 150. It says, <clears throat> he talks about the two comforters and he says there is something that connects those two comforters. Um, it's it's in, you keep reading to the end of that and he talks about the spirit of revelation and the spirit of revelation connects the first comforter, which is the Holy Ghost and the second comforter, which is Jesus Christ, two veils. So when you talk about a rebirth justification preparation for sanctification you have a baptism of fire is what nephi calls that and the baptism of fire in the holy ghost so you can lay the tree of life right on this picture as well i mean you can lay every prophet scripture every prophet's story on this because they're all following the same path that we all follow it's it's a straight and narrow path yeah i i see that same pattern in in Lehi's vision, uh, I see it in Second Nephi thirty-one, where it talks about the doctrine of Christ. I see it in uh, um, King Mosiah's people when he asked them if they if they believe the things that he taught them, and mm -hmm. they said how they viewed themselves in their own carnal state, and and they went through this born again process, and they were being sanctified. So it's it's like the pattern is over and over, over and over and over in the scriptures. You see it in the the parable of the prodigal son, and it's like once you see it, not, not see it. <laughs> it all over the place that I the see see. Christ is is everywhere. And um, Esther, I think that was the one that really woke me up. I was reading Esther's story and she had to go into the presence of the king on behalf of delivering her people. 
And we'll see that that's kind of the pattern here. So, and, and that's what I'm like, wait a minute, this is an everything. So, um, but I hadn't got, I hadn't received this document yet. So I, I didn't know what it was. I just started noticing a pattern. And once I received this document, I realized this is the pattern they're all fulfilling. And Christ makes that clear. This is the pattern I'm going to give you. So, okay. So that's, that would be baptism of fire justification. Okay. So in here in the holy place, okay. What comes after our initiatory? What ordinance comes next? That's the endowment. Yep. So this, this endowment is like your sanctification. But like I said, the endowment goes over the whole thing, but you can see where you can pay attention to the story and see where it picks up. Okay, and so right here, this is a incense altar, which would be like a prayer altar right before a veil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can go and, and look through the endowment and take these symbolisms and put them all together and you start to get more context of the story. So we'll go, we'll walk over that after we keep going through these ordinance, but we'll walk through a little bit more context here in a minute. Um, but this is like your endowment. The endowment is like your sanctification. And I'm not sure about the women's initiative or the men's initiatory, if, if they're the same, but um, they're, a, they're a little different. Yeah, I think they're a little different. Essentially, you're being prepared to learn to discern between truth and error. Yeah. And so really, truly, <laughs> I think this is where your mind starts to speak symbolism. And because there is so much... Um, uh, deceit and symbolism. This is why you need to be prepared to continue on this path because it's going to get a lot harder. So you're going to be washing your, you're going to be making, um, you're going to have a covering for you as you go through this journey. And, um, anyway, and then <clears throat> I also think this is very much an inward journey. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is a much of a reflection, a self-reflection, I think, and we'll talk about why. And then as you go through the veil, there's another altar here. That's the mercy seat, the Holy of Holies. And what ordinance would that remind you of? <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, uh, the ceiling. Ceiling and the ceiling power, right? I mentioned. Yeah. So um, in, in its fullness, very similar to what Nephi and Lehi had, who I believe had fulfilled this path. And that is, that's how they came to that fullness. But like everything we enter in at a portion until we grow in that and receive a fullness. But like president Nelson has said, you're choosing here or now, which kingdom. So this is, you can see, I've got it um, lined off here. This is actually this whole outer court was considered the telestial and it gets smaller as you go. This um, tent here, the holy place was the um is like the terrestrial and then this perfect square is the celestial and so when you've well we'll talk about it more when we talk about being ratified by the holy spirit of promise but um okay so now what i want to go over is moses's journey okay what moses was asked to set up here was their story and I think that gets very personal to us because our covenant path is our story. So the Lord starts with a word within us and he plants that in our heart. And if we nurture it, it grows into the tree of life. And Elder Benner has talked about that tree of life is Jesus Christ. And, and this is his doctrine. So it's like the word grows into a story. You become the living record. You become alive in Christ. You become the doctrine of Christ in your own yeah spirit totally having his image yeah. yeah because you have completed this this pathway so um and like i said I, I the points of the doctrine are the same for all of us the law of sacrifice the law of chastity the law um all these ordinances that we need but the way we fulfill that is is infinite and individual like you see abraham was asked to sacrifice his only son where um, the young rich man was asked to sacrifice all his riches, right? So depending on what has our heart more than the Lord does, 
will likely be our, our sacrifice in this life. And, and then we'll continue to apply that law continually. But um, it's not a pattern that we all have to be the same. There's so much individuality, but the points are what we need to fulfill. Um, okay, so Moses, Moses' story, for example, the Passover, right, was symbolic of the atonement. And they had to put the blood of the lamb on the door. So that's that's symbolic right here where the high, they would come meet the high priest and they would offer up a lamb for sacrifice and they'd have a meal with him. That was the Passover um, symbolic of the atonement right there. So the Israelites themselves had to do that. The labor of water, right? They had to go through the water before they could get into the wilderness and were free from their adversary. So that's a really important part, I think, right there to note um, in our temple endowment. So they walk through, the, remind me to come back to that. They walk that's, that's, through, a, that's another perfect example. The, the whole story of the Exodus is, is again, um, a pattern mm -hmm. of the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> it's also and, Adam and Eve's story. And so yeah. I want to show you where that comes into play with them. Um, then, so they went they, they finally were free of Pharaoh, but then they were not yet ready to enter the promised land. So tree of life, promised land, that would be this. So they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And what was Moses trying to do with them? He was trying to sanctify them. So again, sanctification stage. And while they were going through their sanctification, they um, the table of shoe bread here. So again, it's just their story. This is, they they had their manna provided for them and the lampstand kind of representing that he was their shadow by day and, and fire by night. And then Moses would go and try to offer up the prayers to the Lord to see if they were, were ready. Um, and so the, again, their story, right. And they had to cover, they had to carry the Ark of the covenant. So <clears throat> what, is interesting, I think, that we see again as a pattern in everybody's story, and this is very true for us today, it, as, as the covenant people on this path. Um, Moses himself, you, if you read Moses' story, he had to fulfill this path before he could go deliver others to fulfill this path. So I have a friend whose dad has helped with the church's pornography program and kind of the ending the ending um, thing that keeps you from ever falling back into the addiction is they have you involved in helping others, helping deliver others through the same thing. And that's kind of like the eternal, if you do that, you'll, you're like free. And we, we see that pattern here that once you've completed, you got to go back and deliver others. You got to help them through. And so Moses, um, I won't go through a story, but you, you can read and kind of see the symbolism. And then he goes back. And or he's he's kind of taking them along as he's fulfilling this himself. Nephi is the same thing. Nephi's kind of turning into Moses. He's going through these points, you know, while he's trying to help his brothers through these points. And you can see the symbolism show up um, along the way. But what what is happening is in Egypt, they were that's like Babylon for us today. Um, in this stage, this celestial stage. Egypt was acting upon them. And once they got out and they were finally free from Pharaoh and all the false philosophies and all the false indoctrinations and everything that had been, you know, skewing with their internal word, word they were free and then wandering through the wilderness where they could be sanctified. But the problem was, is, is Egypt was still in them. So Egypt was now not acting upon them, but it was still in their own patterns. And so the Lord, they, you know, they were still trying to worship false idols. And, and so the Lord finally said, your generation is not going to make it in. It's going to be the next one. I, like I got to purge this out of you. It lives in your blood. I got to sanctify your blood. I got to clean the blood and sins of all the generations who have gone before you because it lives inside you now. And so they're being purged and sanctified and, prepared to go into the promised land. 
So I think that's very symbolic of us today. Um, you know, where we've been living in Babylon and, you know, our prophets at some point are, are taking us, I feel like they're already telling us, get out of Babylon, <laughs> um, but they will carry us out and guide us out spiritually. And, and, but then we have to go through sanctification, which is like the refiner's fire. So that one, I think is, I think it gets harder. <laughs> it's like you're being purged. And so it's just so much internal work, um, self-reflection, but there is a hope now. Um, you can map this out too, as faith, hope, and charity, charity, the greatest of all, um, is eternal life. It is the celestial kingdom. But well, I think, I think everybody in order to become sanctified has to go into some form of a wilderness experience. I, I know I, I've had that experience you know, it's, uh, it's almost like a paradoxical trial, <laughs> um, and and sometimes they last for years and years, and uh, hard, hard to maybe explain. But I th I think we all do go through a a wilderness experience, like Lehi and his family, and Moses and the children of Israel. You see it over and over again. In well, the scriptures. I think part of what that can be is, like you said. A a paradoxical experience of like a giant paradigm shift in your mind you see it with Moses when he kind of had to change his perception of um you know I'm a Hebrew and now I just killed an Egyptian and like that what is going on it what do you call that Cog cognitive dissonance <laughs> where you're half the Lord starts to rework your mind and help you realize how fallen you really are and you know i can imagine how hard it would have been for nephi you you see nephi right from the beginning he has to go ask the lord himself you know my dad's telling us we got to go in the wilderness all these people are corrupt this is where i've grown it would, it would be just like today like my dad is asking me to go do what <laughs> and we all got to go and just trust him nephi had to go figure it out for himself right um but it doesn't mean it's easy because now suddenly everything you knew is stripped from you and you're creating a whole new set of, of mindset. And so I, I really think that's part of that baptism of fire, that sanctification is, is yeah. the paradigm shift of, you know, I read the book of Mormon uh, in the year 2020 and finally realized, Oh, this is talking about me. I mean, I'm the one that's racked in unbelief. I'm thinking it's everybody else in the world who doesn't have the gospel yet. And I'm like, no, Nephi is definitely talking to us, the covenant people yeah. <laughs> telling us to wake up. Yeah. Got our own veils of unbelief. We have to rend. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The dark veil of unbelief. That one's, you know, you see that a lot in, in the scriptures. I again, points to this pattern right here, kind of a great awakening is what, what some people call it, but the initiatory is definitely preparing you to, now go travail that wilderness where you don't know what's true anymore you don't know what's what and the lord's saying well I'll, I'll guide you if you'll if you'll just look at me i'll guide you but this is where it gets hard and then the it's like that terrestrial um that, that holy place terrestrial state of being is almost like a veil itself um that's yeah, being, like that we're he's just pulling through the holy spirit he's he's uh sanctifying us and putting us through uh refiner's fires and and just rending us so to speak to to uh to the point where we're ready to to enter his presence i consider this whole phase here from this veil to this veil as a veil like yeah i would agree with you're, that you're and you're going through mists of darkness and you yeah um I also think of it, you know, there's a lot of mirror symbolism in the temple, but it's, it's like a giant mirror. It's start to realize that every, all the experiences happening in my life are trying to teach me something and trying to reflect what I'm putting out there. You know, what I think that's why you need a covering <laughs> because you would destroy yourself with all your fallen nature, but you start to see oh, this might be happening to me for a reason, something I haven't yet learned, 
um, I had a, I had an experience I kept going through over and the same type of experience over and over and over. And finally, my friend said one day, Nikki, maybe you haven't learned the lesson that you need to learn. And I thought, oh, maybe this, maybe the world is just trying to show me something, you know, and, and the Lord has created this experience to sanctify us so that we can see, um, that we can see the straight way more clearly, if that makes sense. Yeah. I caught, I just, I think the closer we get to the veil, it, it becomes more a hall of mirrors and you kind of have to learn to see which mirror has his image in it, his, his reflection back. I like that. Um, okay. So, so I think we went over the Israelites and again, you can compare that to Nephi and Nephi goes through a very similar theme. Um, I don't know any questions, anything huge. I go into a lot more detail on my channel and on specific topics, but um, there's a lot I could say. So I'll just stop there for now, I guess. Yeah, that's great. God prevails. You can see the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, oh, well, this is one other thing I wanted to say about the Israelites journey. Um, so you have, every time the Lord gives patterns of threes, I go, I go plug it in here and it's like, it seems that simple. And the, as I read the context of what's going on, it's like, yeah, you'll see similar words, faith, justification, atonement. They're, they all kind of seem synonymous with each other. Um, and then hope, faith, hope, charity, Hope is like, I guess it used to mean, I looked this up in ancient Hebrew or something, and it it meant trust to an extent. And so you think about it, the Israelites, they could not, like they had to depend on the Lord completely for their water, for their manna. If they tried to take too much and like take power unto themselves, then they, it would rot. Like this sanctification sanctification stage is learning to completely trust in the Lord. But I don't think you can do that unless you have a hope. You kind of have that awakening like, oh, this is not for nothing. This is, there's something coming at the end. You see Christ at the end of the tunnel. And so now you're like, okay, please help me through this. I know it's going to be hard, but, but also I have hope that this is for a reason. So you, you kind of learn to let go of your doubt and your fears during this phase and completely rely on the Lord. Where I can see a lot of these uh, same patterns that we'll go through as we get nearer and nearer to the second coming, the, the sanctification that we'll go through because of the calamities and the, and uh, the cleansing mm -hmm. of our country <laughs> and the world. And <clears throat> If you know the Lord and you know his pattern, and, he, and I think this is where the brother of Jared eventually got to, the Lord couldn't be withheld from the veil because the brother of Jared knew him completely. And the more you build that trust in him, the more I think you can be like, um, who was the woman when Elijah came and she, he asked for her last bit of food and she gave it to him. You know, I think if you know the Lord, you're going to be like, please take this from me because I know that if you do that, he, he's going to give more in abundance, right? Because you know him versus that fear of this is all I have left. Um, it's going to be a lot better state to have worked this out, worked your fears out, gone through your sanctification before that day comes rather than have to be sanctified through it. Um, and who knows? I had a friend once ask me, I got a freeze dryer and we were helping get our ward ready and with emergency prep and um, a friend came over once and he's checking out my operation and he's like, how do you know that when the day comes that you would be able to give this away if you had to? And I said, I don't, that's why I give it away now. <laughs> So I give it away now because all I can do is act in the pattern that the, I know the Lord is in hopes that, that that builds a character in me that, that when that day comes, I know it, right? I think that's partly why uh, President Nelson says that the spiritual preparation is even more important than the, the temporal preparation. Yeah. Um, part of that spiritual preparation is having a heart that's so softened, you know, and having such a level of trust and faith in 
in the Savior that we've stepped out of the world. The world means nothing to us anymore. Yeah, um, but in the same token, you know, you see a lot of people think, well, it's just it's just spiritual. You don't need to get uh, prepared either. You know, if you're spiritually prepared, then you're good. Yeah, but the Lord seems to work in tandem with temporal and spiritual. <laughs> so if that becomes, um, you know, a justification to not have to do anything, I think that we don't understand how the Lord grows us spiritually through the temporal task. Right. And so he'll ask us to do something to see if, if we will follow through. And that's how we learn the truths about him in a deeper way. And we, we get that written within us um, versus you know, does that make sense? I feel like anybody, oh, yeah. who, anybody who has been through this path and has come to really be spiritually prepared the way the Lord expects. And somebody says, Oh, I feel like I need to go get, I feel like the Lord's telling me I need to go buy some beans. <laughs> You're not going to say, Oh, all you need is spiritual prep. You say, then you go do it. <laughs> if the Lord tells you to do it. You do it because you know that he, you just listen to him and that's how it's done. It's not done by just saying, well, spiritually prepared. We're good. It's, it's go build a boat. Let's go, you know, um, go get the plates, go it's, it's tasks. And then along the way, it's like you gain, you gain the relics or the tokens and the things that you need to, um, to know the Lord and his character, undoubtedly, not just that yeah. spiritual is good enough. Yeah. Those are a couple of themes I heard in this last conference. Uh, one was, you know, having, our, our trust be stretched. Remember that being talked about a couple of times. Stretched, and then when we get to the point where we've increased our trust, then it's stretched again. Exactly. And then heeding, heeding every prompting. Learning, like you said, <laughs> you're prompted to go buy some more beans, whatever, whatever it is. You know, um, as long as it's not wrong, you do it. <laughs> yeah, whatever that prompting is to to act on it, to heed it. Um. Like you said, that you you go through that stretch and then you kind of go again and then you stretch again. That that brings me back to Elder Rimland's talk. Um, I love this talk so much because this has become very important to me. This doctrine of Christ because of of what it symbolizes in in I believe this is being sealed up into eternal life. That this is being washed white by the blood of the Lamb. They used to take the blood from the altar of sacrifice and then take it to the mercy seat. Um, and if you'll remind me, I'll come back and talk about that. But <clears throat> this is this is how it's done. This is all those promises of, of what the saints became and overcame. This is how they did it. And um, and we're going to want that that power in the days ahead. But one of the biggest things I've learned from this is I kind of started to notice this years before I really understood it as the doctrine, but I noticed this pattern in my life that anytime I was working on progressing in an area of my life in one way or the other, that there was this pattern that seemed to follow um, to kind of get me to that goal I was trying to achieve or trying to do better at something. And, and I've realized <laughs> that this is a pattern of creation. This is, this is how the Lord creates. This is how the world was created. This is how we were created. This is how we become like gods. Um, this pattern of creation is revolutionary. And so I've had, you know, I've just seen this pattern kind of throughout the scriptures and I have kind of had formed this idea together in my mind, but then Elder Renlund really sealed that in for me, that this is a cyclical process that you run over and over and over again, that every, every word that's planted in you goes through this pattern. Every revelation goes through this process. And so it's got to grow like, like anything else. And so when you're trying to work on something with the Lord and, and get stronger in one of these areas, um, you, you can expect to see the same journey in that specific area. It's revolu it's revolutionary. 
And so every point of the doctrine should be ratified by the Holy Spirit of promise in its fulfillment of having run its cycle, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so Elder Renlin talked about enduring to the end and that it's not just, and I've pondered about that forever because the Lord does not, his words have context and they have depth. And so if you seek it, there's, there's other words that are synonymous with it that help you understand what does he mean by this and endure to the end culturally is thought of as like, you just, you got to wait it out till you die. You got to wait it out till Christ comes. He'll come and we just got to bear through it. I'm like, that doesn't seem to be what that phrase means. It seems to mean that you have discovered who Christ is and you apply it over and over and over and over again until over and over and over and over again until you come back into his presence. And so I kind of saw it as that it's this, it's this pattern. It's this pattern that he's got laid out here, this cyclical pattern. You apply it again and then you find a new area that needs to be sanctified. You apply it again and the Lord will guide you through that. You know, you have this problem that you need to be sanctified in and you run through the doctrine of Christ with it and over and over again. And that is enduring, but you're enduring with hope because you, you now know it's like each time you go through a revolutionary round, it's similar to like one of the brother of Jared Stone's lighting up and he, they light up. And now because you've done it so much, you have a sheer knowledge of Christ and who he is and can't be withheld from the veil at that point. And so I just, I loved his talk because he, he talked about that. It's keep applying this over and over until, and I think that's when it's sealed in you and the Lord knows he can trust you because you know his pattern. We're not perfected, right? We're not perfect, but we are perfect in Christ, which means we perfectly know how to apply this pattern. I think it's also why we are being encouraged to be in the temple as often as we possibly can. That we're, we're in, enduring in that covenant process. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it's just amazing. This is so so. Uh, so so fabulous how like you said these symbols can mean so many different things and and the the temple is is like the lord's university yeah it, these seem like really simple things in a in a little simple tent but but actually it's like the the mysteries of the universe <laughs> there to be in laws of creation in different yeah. realms what what realm do you want to inherit here's your laws of creation here's your laws of creation and so forth yeah well just nice to see and and stay in the process and and uh stay in in the covenant with us with the savior he's going to get us there um you can see that this this path is very individual um like moses fulfilled nephi fulfilled they all fulfilled individually but then you also see throughout the scriptures how the covenant people as a whole where they're at So somebody can be here along their path at this point, you know, sorry, at this point here, you know, ready to pierce the veil, but, but the people as a whole, maybe we're only here, you know, or maybe we've just barely entered the gate and we got a long way to go as a whole, right? But the more people who come through this, the more we progress as a people as a whole. And so that's kind of what the Israelites did. They, Moses was, you know, much further along, he had he had conversed with the Lord and, um, and then other people had gone up to the mountain to converse with the Lord when others weren't yet ready. So those people, what they get that weren't ready, they got the, te- they got the law of Moses rather than the Melchizedek. Right. But those who had gone had received the higher law. So you see the individuality that you can have with the Lord, but then also the ability to be a part of that, that covenant group as well. It, it embodies both. And so I think it's really important to go ask the Lord, well, where am I at on this path? And what's important for me at this time may not be the same. You know, what's the most important thing for you right now might be different for me, depending on where we're at on the path. But then you can look and pay attention to what our prophets are saying and kind of get an idea where we're at as a people, as a whole. And I could do a whole hour talking about, I think the Lord or the prophet is telling us it's time to 
pierce this veil and go into the terrestrial. It's, it's all over the symbolism. It's everything they talk about. It's everything they changed. It's every change in the temple endowment. They're, they're showing that as a people, we are progressing um, down the aisle to the Lord. Yeah, I, I just saw President Nelson's talk in conference as an invitation, you know, to go study section 109 and see these, these promises that are available to us through the these priesthood keys that we have restored. Yeah, I don't think he I don't think he was very subtle in what he was saying. He he said <clears throat> promise to them yeah. can happen in the temple today and think about how that applies to you personally. I I don't think yeah, he the, the promise on the Kirtland Temple was that, that it could be a place where the Lord can come and manifest himself. Yeah, it was this this how do we apply that personally? <laughs> like prepare to have, you know, be in a place where he can manifest himself to us individually. Yeah. I used, I used to think that all, everything going on in the temple was a post death thing. Like when you die, Yeah. Um. this, this is just a knowledge you need for when you die. And until, you know, one day that veil of unbelief came off <laughs> and I realized, wait a minute, there's nothing about death in this. In fact, the veil meant life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, the veil means life. The door is the way to the truth. So again, if you look at the, so this is the door is also the truth. You look at what the initiatory is preparing you for, it's to go through that door of truth, right? So um, anyway, so much fun symbolism. Oh, the one, the one other thing I wanted to point out um, that I think is really important on a personal scale and really, um, inspiring and exciting that people can hope for, for and um, is that you know anytime you go through creation like a plant coming up a seed coming up through the ground it's got to pierce the ground right and if it doesn't it's not strong enough to to sustain uh, it's kind of like for us we have to go through that that pressure and that um uh, the trial and the, the adversary. And so just like the Israelites, when they finally crossed the Red Sea, they, that was the point they were finally free of Pharaoh, but they weren't done with their journey yet. They still had to be sanctified. They weren't free of themselves yet. <laughs> That's why I say this is a big self-reflection. Yeah, it's like they had a new life, but, uh, there's a higher rebirth that's still ahead. <laughs> yes. There's a rebirth. And then yet another <laughs> and when you're free of i would call that um completely free of the natural man the ego the that's why i think it's very self-reflection is um your your divinity is finally free of of your false nature so with with nephi and i didn't realize this the last time i read nephi when he slays Laban, I always thought that seems very similar to when like Pharaoh's taken out because Nephi picks up a sword and that sword has some symbolism. The uh, same thing, David was commanded to take the sword. So again, you, you put that sword into context, um, maybe with some of the signs and the endowment and you, you start to see, oh, that's what's going on. So Laban um, was like, he was kind of free of the adversary. And then you see kind of what happens next. Um, that are just anyway um adam and eve kind of have a similar experience where satan's cast out right but they're not done with their journey they have to keep going there's still things that they have to do and accomplish and then and that's kind of where um the video clips off and then and then we kind of go learn um what's next for us because that's where we pick up that's kind of where we're at so I just think that's really interesting that Satan only has power in the celestial world. So once you have um, spiritually progressed into that terrestrial, now I, it really is a work of sanctification, a cleansing of the blood and sins of generations and a, a self-reflection. Yeah, it's so, so amazing. I hear people say, you know, if, if this was true, why, why aren't we hearing this from the church leaders or... It, President Nelson is saying, seek to be taught by the Lord himself. Be in the temple every chance you can. 
in essence, go into the Lord's university and, and gain these eyes to see and, and be taught by the spirit. That's the only way we're going to, we're going to get to that veil and pass through it. I think a part of the reason is for that is they could tell you all day long and you still wouldn't believe it's kind of like yeah. an angel and still not believe the only thing that, that grows you is that sure witness by the Holy ghost. And so yeah. they're not going to deny that for you. <laughs> they're not going to, they're like, yeah. you know, you need to go. And that's why, you know, here are just, just take the patterns, the scriptures, their words in the temple and start applying it all together. And, and you'll start to figure it out for yourself. Not because these are the true points of the doctrine and you can, yeah. Okay. It's like seeing the angel, like, okay, I've seen it. But when you become it and it happens in your life, then you can't deny it. Like, oh, this happened to me. This happened to me. This is, this is, I, this story is alive in me. And you start to see witnesses of that taking place within you. And then at that point you can't deny it. And if you did, then, then you would be the son of perdition. Um, because that would, to me, it's like, that would be denying your own existence. Like you've been made alive in this way, you know? So, and also seeing Christ at every step along the way, seeing him minister to you <laughs> through, through the symbolism or through the ordinance, you know, what is he actually really doing in the spiritual realm for you? Um, I think for me, it's, it's seeing beneath these symbols to this personal intimacy we can have with the savior. Is, I think, I think you need that personal intimacy because I think he's so much close. I, I don't think we realize how, um, how close he is. I could think that we think that he's out there in the universe on his throne and in not thinking about us, but the more you start to understand the nature of God, um, well, my own personal experience was when I kind of started to come to, I would say, <laughs> wake up to uh, the veil of unbelief coming off. I could see, um, because, you know, in the endowment, who gives Adam or who gives Eve the fruit? It's Satan. And he's right there as soon as she wakes up, right? Um, I could see how close he was, how much Satan was right in front of me all this time. And I had no idea. But now suddenly I could see it in everything. And and I wanted to know, I thought, well, if Satan's that close, then then shouldn't the Lord be closer? <laughs> Should, isn't that the promise? Shouldn't he be closer? And I'm like, where are, like, are you right in front of me? And I can't see, where are you? And um, I think he is closer. He's, he's inside. And it's just a matter of being aware. And I think that's why, back to why that awareness and we're growing in awareness as we go, because we start to grow into what always has been he's he's right there i read a story about um it was buddha under it was a painting of buddha under the ginkgo tree and he was laughing he was looking up laughing because he had spent 16 years trying to find god only to realize that god was within him and so you know we see a lot of outward projection it, it, you know that what we see out there but God is so much on what he's created within us. He's, he's so, he's so real in us. And if we follow this doctrine of Christ and Christ becomes alive in us quite literally until we see what, what that, um, you know, it's a little bit of side tangent here, but that, that Holy spirit of promise, I think of as um, we shall see him for we shall be like him that really what that, that manifestation or that witness of Christ is, is really an outward projection of what's been made alive in you. So it, it's, it's the image of Christ is actually the effect of the cause. The cause is that he's made alive in you and then he's projected out. And, and so um, that's one way I kind of think of that is, is, uh, that second comforter witness experience is really a um, an effect of the cause. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
Well, Nicole, this has been absolutely delicious for me. I, I, I I'm sure most of the listeners are, are loving it as, as much as I am. So, but hey, thank you so much for this. Um, yeah. Wow, great stuff. And uh, let's uh, let's do this again. Let's go into maybe some of the things you could go deeper into tonight. And okay, yeah, we can do something again in the future. Thank you for being with us on the Spiritual Survival Podcast. Again, if the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content.